Well, welcome everyone. Uh, Howie's asked me to uh, open our session this afternoon. It's going to be a very special session, I, very close to my heart, because this is the tenth to marks the tenth year uh, where Calgary completed. Uh, it was one of the first cities to develop a poverty reduction strategy, enough for all. In May of 2013, City Council and the United Way both approved the plan, community-led uh, by Rotarian Steve Allen and, uh, and Kathy uh, Williams with 18 people on a council over 18 months. And that uh, was, was released. And of course, in 2015, uh, the uh, 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 Vibrant Communities Calgary was given the opportunity to really steward the strategy uh, in the community. That, that meant the, in, the, the development of an implementation plan because the strategy did not have an implementation plan, had some general directions and, and uh, with accept of whatever, with a very explicit goal uh, of a 10 year goal, 2023, to reduce poverty, the level of poverty by 50% in our city. Uh, that was back uh, very bold at the time. And that's what the work has been I had the privilege of uh, working at Vibrant Communities uh, until 2019, uh, involved with a great team, uh, both board and staff, and lots and lots of community organizations and individuals. And of course, at that time, um, it was time for me to retire. And uh, But uh, Megan Reed, a Newfoundlander, and you know how Newfoundlanders think, so it's great to... Uh, that, uh, very, very many involvements in the social sector, especially within health, and then certainly uh, with uh, women, uh, uh, resident, residents for women fleeing violence. Anyway, the board appointed Megan to be the president and CEO of uh, Vibrant Communities Calgary in September of 2019. And so we're just delighted uh, that this afternoon, uh, because the, the city and the United Way both have, this is now the third renewal of a contract to continue to uh, advance poverty reduction. I mean, this is really, really positive. Uh, we went through two contracts when I was there uh, and now this is the third one and it's been renewed again for another four years, which is the duration of city council. So this is very, very positive. So we thought uh, this is kind of an underpinning uh, Calgary led the way as one of the first cities to have a poverty reduction strategy. Uh, and so I think uh, certainly working with poverty reduction strategy communities across the, at the Tamarack Institute and others. So really Megan, uh, and as Howie's already kind of, we've done this before at these meetings, there will be a panel today. Megan is gonna head it. Uh, and then of course, we're just so delighted to have uh, uh, Core Top uh, and uh, Corey Ryerson, and Emily Campbell uh, is part of uh, the panel today. So just delighted and I'm gonna turn it over to Megan. The, the flow we're gonna suggest, there'll be some, uh, uh, Megan will give us an overview of uh, a bit of an update on, on where it's going uh, relative to poverty reduction, very important strategy in our city. And then with a the panel, it'd be kind of having some uh, discussion and then obviously for all of us to bring our points of view on going forward, because we learned from way back, we will not implement, enough for all will not become a reality unless everyone is involved. And so with that, Megan, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Awesome, thanks Franco. And uh, uh, while I was a little upset, he just handed this thing over to me right before a pandemic. <laughs> no one could have seen it coming. Um, Franco, we couldn't, do what I do without um, you having done what you did. And so I'm um, very grateful for, for that. Really awesome to see everybody um, today. And I'll just start by acknowledging the fact that we are on, uh, I'm sitting, maybe you all are as well, on Treaty 7 land, Métis Region 3. And um, instead of giving long land acknowledgements of VCC, we try to impart some wisdom that we recently learned. I was at a, a conference the past couple of days, um, we're part of a major national research projects about quality in the built form. So how do you build the city that addresses inequality and um, 
that makes it a great inclusive neighborhood for everybody. Um, and Elder and Chief Lee Crowchild opened that and said, you know, we've, we've become very used to calling ourselves settlers when we open things or identifying ourselves. And he called on everybody to call ourselves treaty people. So to be involved in the solution. I thought that was really compelling. And so I'll ask everybody to, to think about that as well. Um, really excited about the panelists today because they're the people closest to the work. And those are the voices to hear from, but I will give a small update on VCC. Um, talk a little bit about our Beneath the Surface report, um, and then we'll get into some great conversation. That sounds good to the panelists. Awesome. Okay. Um, so vibrant communities, I think really, you know, from my perspective, uh, changed quite a bit because of the pandemic. We were really um, put into a sphere where we had to start uh, really rapidly sense making and translating what the poverty landscape was looking for, looking like in Calgary for decision makers at all orders of government, for influencers in the community. And so that in some ways called on us to kind of step a bit out of our just kind of slightly invisible backbone role and to take leadership where we were seeing gaps and where we were asked to. And I think it also um, put us in, in the realm of, of really throwing a lot of weight behind research. Calgary is one of the very few cities, uh, major cities in Canada that doesn't have a um, uh, uh, research council, social, you know, social research council and so and planning council. I think BCC has picked up a lot of that work um, over the over the past four years or so. And then of course, um, the other thing that makes us, uh, two things that make us unique is how we include the voices of lived experience um, in everything that we do. And then also our champions. We have Bobby here, who's an enough for all champion. Um, and, and it's really, you know, all of us moving together um, towards the same kind of system change outcomes that is making things fairly successful. And I presented to the city council yesterday and said to them that <laughs> I, you know, this is like my fourth annual year of that kind of presentation to council. And I said that I had never used the word optimistic in council chambers ever until yesterday. They were the first time of feeling truly, truly, truly optimistic about where we can go, even in despite, you know, of us on the heels of an affordability crisis and recession and pandemic mostly because of how the community is thinking about poverty and systems change. And I, I feel strongly that, that the city has changed what we're willing to tolerate because there's a new community vulnerability that I haven't seen since I've been in the city. So that's, that's a bit about some of what VCC has been focusing on. Um, you can raise your hand on your video if you've got it on. Um, who here has read the Beneath the Surface report? <laughs> I know Quentin has. All right, Emily, awesome. Glad the panelists have. All right, I'm gonna pick on Quentin. What were your initial, sorry. What were your initial thoughts about the Beneath the Surface report? Um, I, I shared them on LinkedIn. Don't you remember reading them? I, I do. <laughs> That's why I was comfortable I, picking you. I remember we were joking. I almost used the wrong <laughs> adjective. I thought I thought it meant something else than, 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 than what it does. But um, no, I was, really uh, struck by the report overall. Um, I, it, it, um, it, it really helped. What, 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 it, what I love the most about it is, you know, some of the, the data found in it and some of the findings or insights are things that we, we do talk about on a, on a, on a you know, uh, on a fairly regular basis. So some of it wasn't new information for me, but the way you packaged it was such a compelling case for support and a rallying cry for for bringing people together and 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 trying to you know take some action on it uh, was was what really struck me the most is is how you were able to bring some really important information together and really inspired me. And we've had a few conversations here at United Way about it already. Uh, internally and and trying to unpack it as a team and it's just been exciting to to um to work with the the information in that form that you you were able to so wonderfully put together for us so amazing thanks Quentin I'll get you that beer later no, I'm just kidding <laughs> no, really really appreciate that and um United Way was a really positive contributor to that report as well I want to say in terms of of how we did that so I'm just going to give a quick presentation about beneath the surface um and, and then we'll move into the better part, which is the discussion. So 
the, the reason we did this, there's a couple of reasons. One is that we needed to understand what poverty is, is looking like and feeling like beyond that income number. The income number is important, but like what it's looking like across a lot of domains is just as important. And can I just, Franco, can you see my screen? Yeah. Slides, okay. Not all my messy desktop with several documents that I don't put on a shared drive. Good, um, <laughs> excellent. So, so we need to understand rapidly and more quickly than we ever have what poverty looks like and feels like in Calgary so that we can address it in the right focused ways. Um, and the challenge here is that like, actually, you know, if you talk to council or an MLA or anybody else, we actually have a lack of standardized poverty metrics in our city. So that can make it really confusing. For, for policymakers. There's a lot of duplication, like for years, you know, VCC was putting out the poverty snapshot, um, Calgary Foundation was putting out its quality of life survey, all these things that were duplicative and also not necessarily um, uh, complementary, I think in some cases, fragmentation of data, and then there's just like a lot of data. So we brought 10 partners to do a shared measurement project, the first of its kind around this, um, to really start to understand the problem. Because we, cannot change what we don't understand, which is quite, quite important. Um, so just like a few examples of some of the things we looked at, um, and like Emily would be more familiar with a lot of this than even I would, but you know, if we're looking at housing need, it's not just like how many units are available in the city. Um, you know, we have, we have a huge number of people in the city, um, over 81,000 who are paying more than 30% of their income on shelter and that officially makes them in unaffordable housing. That is a staggering number and it's, it's probably you know, higher than that. Um, so that's the, to that sort of last point. Um, there's also a lot of challenges in terms of housing need around unsuitability. So you could have a house, for example, but not be in an appropriate house or not be in a house that accommodates the size of your family. We're really famous here for opening up one bedroom and studio units and saying, well, we have this many units, but that has not matched the um, composition of the city in a long time. You have multi-generational families. And, you know, I think with newcomers, we're seeing a lot of that as well. So that was sort of one area, but we'll, we'll poke at Emily a bit more on as well. <laughs> um, okay. So again, these are sort of some of our, our partners. Um, so looking at food security, which I know has been a, a really hot topic for Rotary for some time now, um, you know, the stories that we heard on this one were really important. Um, some of the medical professionals we talked to, this was a nurse said, some, some parents are unable to afford certain vital nutrients to feed their children. It can affect their growth. Um, others have said that they're seeing people and children show up malnourished in Canada at the hospital, right? Like these are very compelling and um, sad stories. 21% of Calgarians can't afford healthy food. And of course, that makes sense because we're the most food insecure um, province in the country. And that makes no sense from a wealth perspective, if you think about it, right? So there's a lot of deep system issues there that are really, you know, incredibly challenging, but also solvable. So Corey, look out for you, because I'm going to look for, for your experience on that as well. Um, in terms of income, I mean, we saw some really interesting things. Keep in mind that this captures when we had CERB. So the important thing to know is that the rate of poverty decreased for a while. And on a trend line since 2016, poverty has actually decreased, even if you look at today's numbers. But we do have those peaks and valleys that are happening. Um, what was important around CERB and why that's important to look at income geared solutions is because income grew most significantly for those that were in the bottom 10% of distribution, um, which is which is interesting. And we, we are still the second most unequal city in terms of income in the country, but that, that income inequality is, is decreasing, which I think is important. More stunning perhaps though, is uh, the increase in the poverty rate among young adults, 18 to 24. That's the group that went up and that should really concern us. And if we look at that sort of evidence compared to programs, for example, so the UCP uh, you know, uh, put out a pretty good affordability emergency package, for example, but it actually left out like singles and students if you didn't have kids in that 18 to 24 bracket or if you weren't on ACE or another income support. And so like that was an example where we're trying to feed evidence in that says, 
wait when you're considering rolling out programs like this let's look at where the need is in the greatest way so that we can really tackle that um one of the things that we also <laughs> discovered here is that we um have a lot of working poor uh, in Calgary, 41,890. Um, that excludes the student population as well. And we can get into numbers, but I mean, what that tends to look like is people who are working four or five jobs and piecing those together, or a lot of gig work. And that's very, very precarious work because if you cannot be sick, you cannot miss a shift. Um, before that starts to incredibly um, affect your ability to be to meet your basic needs. And again, we have that interesting income gap between top and bottom here. So extraordinary wealth linked with, you know, some pretty deep poverty. Um, in terms of early learning and care, I just think this one's an interesting one because we all have children somewhere in our lives. Um, only 67% of Calgarians have access to affordable child care services. It's quite low and we actually think that number is decreasing. Um, affordability has, has improved except for the people who need it most again. So there's an example of, we need the right evidence to tackle the right programming. Um, and that we lack a lot of data. We stopped collecting a lot of data related to, um, development milestones for children. And one of the interesting parts of that is that your likelihood of being in poverty when you're 21 can almost be determined when you're in grade three. If you are not at a certain grade le reading level at Grade three, we can almost tell you your likelihood of, of ending up in poverty when you were 21 years old. So if we're not collecting that data, especially after the slide that we've experienced in COVID, that's a real, a real challenge. Um, again, housing affordability, pretty, pretty tricky. In terms of employment, high unemployment with youth. Good jobs are hard to find, but there are lots of jobs. So when we see job numbers go up, that's great. But we always need to question what's behind that, of course. Um, but what I most wanted to focus on a bit um, is community belonging, because I think Rotary has been, um, you know, part of the, the Hubs project, I think, as a service group, is concerned a lot with community belonging. Um, not surprising. This is very consistent with, like, global data around quality of life worsening <laughs> over the past few years. Um, there's some, some cool things and indicators about what, neighbors feel their neighbor deserves like a living wage the people in the city really believe that all Calgarians are entitled to a living wage I think that's a really promising sign um and what we saw more than ever perhaps is like like it's it's a good with a bit of a shadow side to it people in poverty are really taking care of each other and some of the threads of community belonging are quite strong um I think the unfortunate part of that is it's out of necessity or survival in some cases to help make ends meet. And we have to maybe look at where some of the gaps are in terms of meeting those needs um, and looking at community belonging in a different way. Um, and then of course, for the NF for All strategy, um, you know, indigenous people as co-creators as our future of our future without poverty is really important. And there's like a number of great indigenous led initiatives focused around belonging that are happening in our city. Um, some outcomes are improving, which is fantastic. Um, and there's been a 17% increase in the indigenous population compared to 2016. Okay, I'm gonna stop the talking. <laughs> if I can figure out how to stop sharing my screen. Does anybody know the answer to that? Howie, could you do me a favor and just say participant stop sharing screen? Or, oh, maybe I've got it. There it is, okay. <laughs> So, um, and feel free to put your reactions to this report in the chat as we go along as well. But let's start off actually with learning a bit more about our panelists. So I'm going to start with you, Emily, and, and I'll ask the same questions to Cora and Corey. Um, can you tell us a bit more about what your organization does? And um, was there anything in this report that resonated for your experience? Absolutely. Uh, so my name is Emily Campbell. I'm the communications director for Home Space Society. We are a Calgary-based nonprofit. Uh, our mission is to build, expand, and maintain the stock of affordable housing here in Calgary. Uh, we currently have 33 buildings, uh, almost a thousand residents, uh, and our mission is really to 
uh, keep building to the best of our ability so that more of that affordable housing is available to the most vulnerable. Uh, we really do target uh, a niche demographic, which is sometimes called the hardest to house, which means people who are dealing with a complexity. So that might be health challenges, mental health challenges, uh, and addictions issues. So we work from a, a housing first perspective, which means that uh, there's very good data that shows that uh, when people are offered housing, it's a really good kind of stable place to uh, tackle other issues that may have brought those people into poverty uh, or, you know, um, uh, you know, give them a safe place from which to uh, transform their lives. So uh, when we house people, we don't require sobriety uh, and we're quite forgiving uh, with our tenants because we know that often home space buildings are the last stop to homelessness. So that's what we do. Um, as for the report, uh, thank you so much to Vibrant Communities Calgary for putting together this uh, data. I know a lot of housing organizations have been working on old data, that 2016 data for a while. Uh, so it's nice to see an update. Um, but I do fear that it's not as rosy as it was in 2021. There was a big push during the pandemic to get people experiencing homelessness housed. Uh, and the community came together and did an incredible job uh, to get uh, people out of poverty into safe, affordable housing. Uh, but what we're seeing now is that with the cost of living crisis and the incredible jump in rents in Calgary recently, we're talking 30, sometimes 37%, depending on which sector of the city you're looking at, uh, that the situation could be more challenging uh, than it's currently reflected in the report. And what we're seeing from um, our partner agencies, uh, and in every single one of our buildings, we partner with a social serving agency that provides the supports uh, to our residents. So that will be, you know, social services, mental health services, sometimes uh, food as well, depending on the acuity of the people in that building. Um, you know, we're seeing from some of our shelter partners that, you know, families are having a harder time finding uh, affordable housing, getting out of shelter, making that transition uh, into market housing because rents are crazy and um, you know large families are having a hard time finding housing that has enough bedrooms uh, for all the kids. So uh, thank you so much again, Vibrant Communities Calgary, because this information is invaluable to our strategic planning uh, and also making the argument that this is you know something that the city should be uh, supporting. Um, and also to the Rotary Club for having us because uh, your support, especially when it comes to maintaining um, our properties, has also been invaluable. So thank you for including us in the conversation. Oh, Emily, thank you for that. I mean, there's so much, um, so many things to, to pull on there. So I'm going to, I'll give a couple of more questions about that. Um, <coughs> I can't. I can't stress the importance enough of housing first housing right now in this current climate. And um, I think we hear that we're hearing that too, in terms of if you want, if you want a sobering experience, go and rent faster. That's yeah, that's where people look for rentals. Um, pick something more than two bedrooms and see what comes up. Even two bedrooms. Even two bedrooms. It is alarming. Sometimes you're looking at thousands thousands of dollars of rent you know like it's it is quite something and so um such a huge challenge for a home space to be dealing with and also the way that you've done that is incredible so thank you for your work um core over to you core and i were chatting I think we saw each other at a stampede event pre-pandemic and maybe once more since then feels like a long time ago uh, but, but could you share a bit more about what your organization does and what in the report uh, resonated for you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, good to see you. And thank you, everyone, for uh, for joining us. Uh, this is very important uh, discussion. Uh, yeah, my, uh, my name is Kortop from Kumkan Africana Institute. It's an institute that provides multicultural education, social justice, uh, innovative uh, research, grassroots research, in that matter. 
bringing wider gap of uh, uh, bridging the wider gap of inclusive uh, inclusive programs and and also uh, so of of newcomer social integration and equitable services. Yes, it empowers newcomers communities, providing employment skill training and to 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 the uh, disadvantages community. Com can provide unlimited opportunities to the grassroots African communities. It strengthened the community capacity through education and research and skill development. Yes, within that, uh, I think uh, going through the pandemic uh, where uh, Com can rise up is when we we did a research on how uh, how the pandemic affected the communities. Mm. So, so it, it, uh, it brought the African communities together, the grassroots organizations, now with, uh, with Calgary African Collective that has membership of 47, uh, 40, 47 organizations of African or Black organization for that matter. Uh, the organization provide mental health and wellness support, uh, basketball program, uh, uh, food, uh, cultural food, hampers, uh, life skill and employment coaching, learning thrive, helping kids and uh, children with uh, uh, after the school program and mentorship and research and social justice. So, now, coming to the report, what resonated with me in the report, uh, I think to me, the report is, uh, really spoke to me hardly. When I look at the area of housing, when I look at unemployment, food security, uh, 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 child care issues, these are, these are the areas that are really critical. To, to the work of Comcan that, you know, uh, raising the capacity of the community members that are members of the uh, Comcan or as an organization and Comcan team and leadership. These, these are areas that really re resonate with me. And I agree with, with Emily that, yes, uh, how far are we going? How far can we go? Yes, uh, comparing the, the data, when we did uh, the the reason we ended up with com with the uh, African Collective is that during the pandemic when we collected data, we found that eighty two percent of those respondents that we survey express the mental health issues, and sixty seven percent express the needs or unemployment issues, mm. uh, and seventy one percent at uh, responded that. Food security is an issue in their households. And 7% uh, talked about uh, the issues or addressing the, the, house, uh, the housing and also childcare issues. A lot of, a lot of these people, they, they can't even afford to pay childcare, irrespective of what. So when we look at all of this, uh, the, the report really resonated with me. But how can, how far can we go, and how 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 long, or how long can we wait mm. to address all of this? So I'll I'll leave it there for now, and thank you very much. Thank you, um, Cora, Give us giving us additional threads to pull on, and um, I think you know what's emerging as well. Like you know the. Emily, and if you looked at any one of these organizations' websites, it'd be very focused and great and whatever. Um, and the, the number of supports that every agency is having to offer right now, the home space goes well beyond housing, right? Um, Comcam, same thing. It's just, it's full on support on almost every level because we're working with people and people are really challenged on every level. I'll be very curious. I'll, I'll sort of ask a question maybe in a bit around uh, the newcomer experience in housing because we talk a lot about it, but I don't see a lot of plans necessarily. Um, Corey, over to you. We talked a bit of food security that keeps coming up. Um, uh, tell us a bit more about leftovers and uh, what resonated for you in this report as well. 
Yeah, for sure. So um happy to be here, everybody. Uh, my name is Corey Ryanson. I'm the executive director of the Leftovers Foundation. And so we're a food rescue charity. So we uh, work with businesses who have excess food for whatever reason as a part of their business cycle, stuff they would normally throw away, but that's perfectly fine to consume. Kind of the easiest example is day old bread. Um, if uh, a bakery always wants fresh bread, customers want that, that's fine. But what do you do with the bread that doesn't get sold at the end of the day? Often it, it does get thrown out. And so we work with those kind of businesses to to redirect it to agencies in the local community who can use it as a, either as directly giving it out through hamper programs, mutual aid programs, um, kind of any kind of uh, central distribution point or as an input to a program for, for an agency, say through like a meal uh, program or a, like a lunch program. Um, so yeah, the, the thing I think, um, I, I really enjoyed the structure of the report in that um, kind of, I guess, like talking about income, but also breaking it out. Like, I, I think it's always important. I, I, I feel like I read it somewhere in there that, you know, that poverty isn't just about income, but it also is about income. <laughs> um, and so representing all of these factors and giving them their own, like, you know, I obviously go to to my section food security right away. And 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 because that's the lens that I always look at everything through and 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 what I'm familiar working with, but it's I think it's nice to 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 look at this really complex problem that does have one underlying current through it, but there is other elements to it that are that are still income dependent. Food 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 security is really a function of of uh, of of an income problem, um, but it can be kind of more complex than that. So I think it's important to talk about all these things, but like always go with an, in, I like that it, it has an income focus, but still gives all of these separate issues their, their own space. Mm. Uh, thanks for highlighting that. Cause we say, you know, often like poverty is always about income, but it's not just about income. It can be a head scratcher <laughs> a bit, but it's so, it's so true. So maybe let's, let's vault from that a little bit. I think one of the things that we talk about at vibrant communities and you are the people closest to the work and the community feeling is is like what is poverty feeling like for you right now so when you are in your work and a lot of work and uh, there's there's no scenario in which case in which your organizations aren't in incredibly stretched um and and you you keep working every day to to meet that need I'm curious from your perspective what poverty is feeling like. Um, so maybe, Core, I'm going to start with you. I'll shake it up a little bit. What does poverty feel like with the, for the people that you are working with? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Megan. Yes, uh, I, I'll start it here. Uh, poverty, uh, as Corey mentioned, it's, it's, all, it's different things. Okay, let's, first of all, let's talk about uh, social determinants of health. This is where poverty looked like. Uh, it comes along. Yes, it's not about, it's not about uh, income, but it's still about income. Because when somebody is in their, you know, worriedness, if somebody is worried that, okay, maybe in one week or one month, I have no, I can't pay my rent, I'm going to be kicked out. That is, that somebody can sleep. If somebody, poverty look like somebody can put the, the food on the table in their, you know, to feed their families. And, 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 and I'll, I'll attack that with an example of sometimes there are community members that I know that works two or three jobs for them to put the food on the table. And, 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 and it's so funny that uh, that, person may be working, one, one person working maybe 16 hours, 16 hours a, a week, uh, 16 hours a day for, you, you know, from two jobs, okay? That is working hard, but it's still making less. And sometimes in our society, we perceive somebody who is making less and working hard as somebody who is not, who is lazy. Mm. You know what I mean? But the hour somebody put in is working hard, but making less because of the amount of the money that the, they are being paid. Okay, compared to somebody who is making five hundred thousand 
a year or million or two million dollars a year, maybe even work from home and take care of their families and what. But this person who is working maybe uh, 16 or 20 hours a week, uh, 20 hours a day, cannot even, cannot even see their families. And then now who is taking care of their families? This is what poverty looked like. Somebody who cannot pay childcare cannot, cannot afford because when you cannot even afford to put the food on the table, leave about childcare. You can't even afford it. Leave about any other um, bills that you wanted to pay. And yes, coming to the, to the pandemic now, the high payment of, of rents that people are going through, that is poverty. And this is, these are all social determinants of health. So when people, when we see people ended up in, in, in shelter, in homeless shelter, we don't know what the cause is. It might be, people assume sometimes it's because of laziness, but really the, 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 the life and the living, the livelihood push them out there. But how can we look at people taking care of somebody who's working hard to be taken care of by the community because they work so hard? How can we make everything like housing and childcare affordable to them? That is what uh, poverty looks like. Mm. Ooh. <laughs> this gave me goosebumps. Incredibly compelling, right? And I... I think one of the the things that you know certainly everybody on this panel spends a lot of time doing is um, dispelling myths about poverty, and one of those is around like work. So looking at this report, I, I have to say from a media perspective, the working poor number was the most surprising. It seemed to to journalists um, because there is this prevailing sort of like laziness. You know, the majority of people who are in poverty are working poor, and working 80 hours a week and with no flex to get sick and no benefits and all you know not a living wage and all of those things and that is just so extraordinarily hard in addition to everything else that you talked about there including the social determinants of health so maybe I'll go over to you Corey a bit again about that feeling of feeling of poverty um you know just because I'm in this work doesn't mean I don't get surprised like the number of medical professionals who talked about malnutrition in Calgary, this wealthy province and city of ours was really heartbreaking for me. Um, you know, and I can't imagine what it's like, first of all, obviously to be the child in that situation, but the parents. And from your perspective, you know, what are you seeing? What is poverty feeling like at Leftovers right now? Yeah, um, higher demand every day. Um, like we did, quite frankly, like we get significantly more requests for food than we can support right um i mean i think our organization provides first off i actually say like food rescue isn't a unique thing uh calgary food bank does food rescue uh there's other groups in the community that do food rescue we, we have a bit of like we have our model of how we approach it and i think that we have a bit of maybe a unique way of structuring some of it but um it's not the right long-term solution for food security to be clear um it provides assistance it's it's a part of the emergency food system which we would all agree is not a uh solution to food insecurity wholesale and so i would say yeah what it feels like is 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 like experiencing that every day of, of kind of knowing you know we have we serve um, around 50 agencies in, in Calgary currently. And, and we have, you know, that number on our waiting list um, of groups who are are looking to trying to support people in their community that don't um, have all the resources they need to do it. Uh, because demand is just, especially I think for, for, we've talked about the increasing rate of food security. One of the things I'll say is uh, new data came out from Proof, which is um, the, the, Institute out of U of T um, that has like Alberta went up again, another percent and a half in terms of the rate of food insecurity at 21.8% at now. Um, we're no longer the worst in the, the country, but that's because other provinces rose farther and faster than us. So uh, it's not really something to, to, to stop and celebrate at all. 
Um, and again, going back to that uh, children piece uh, from their report, sorry, I just had it open. Uh, yeah, 27%, 27.2% of children under 18 live in food insecure households in, in Alberta. And again, that number has gone up from, this is Alberta statistics, but gone up about 6% or, or 5.5%. So I, I think another thing maybe of what poverty looks like, again, that idea of the working poor, right? Like I, you're seeing food banks. I was on a, a call with um, the CEO of um, uh, the Daily Bread, the the food bank in, in uh, Toronto, talking about that they have record numbers of people who are working full time are employed who are food bank users. And I know uh, Calgary uh, and Edmonton food banks, all food banks talk about the same right now that um, there were always these folks accessing those services, but it's significantly worse. Uh, and one of the big things I think too, uh, uh, I've heard a few food banks, both the Daily Bread and, and Calgary Food Bank talk about it, that their usage data has stopped correlating with um with like disability amounts with 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 income assistant amounts and is now correlating with um inflation uh which just shows so that's that's further driving that it's it's folks that we don't i think in our misguided notion of who is poor or what is poverty we wouldn't associate with that because now it's God, not everybody, but like a lot of people, because they're they're feeling the the inflationary pressure of of, of not being able to afford, yeah, the, the adequate nutrition for their children in the grocery store, and having to make sacrifices and decisions that are like impacting them and their children's health. Uh, so it's uh, yeah, it's the current moment is difficult to say the least. It paints such a compelling picture i mean that you that you paint there in terms of like the new users of emergency food services um anytime vcc does anything on food security anything we hear from like people through linkedin right who it all it, it's almost for me like it always starts with the same thing which is i've got a good job my partner has a good job like we just can't make things stretch it's there's some shame and some vulnerability in there too. And it's like the number of people now in our communities that are accessing these services is astonishing. And thanks for sharing that info from proof about children, because I think, you know, that that has got to start to be a priority of ours. Um, absolutely. And of course we know the solution to food insecurity is not more food, it's more income. Um, and that is something that a province this wealthy can start to look at for sure. Um, so Emily, over to you. I mean, one of the things we know is that um, food is like one of the first things to go so that people can start to hold on to their housing. And so by the time people are, are starting to get to a point where they might need a, like a home space home, um, they've probably already made a lot of trade-offs in their life, right? So in terms of what, what you see, what is poverty looking and feeling like for home space? Right. And, you know, we look at this through the lens of, you know, the partners that we partner with in our buildings because they're, you know, doing the on the ground work with the families that we serve. But, you know, for example, the food bank demand was up 20 percent. That was just in February. Um, you know, rent across Calgary has skyrocketed. Um, our partners at In From The Cold have seen demand rise 55 percent since 2022. Um, and there are waiting lists for, you know, the domestic violence shelter discovery house. So things are feeling pretty desperate on the ground, uh, largely related to the cost of living crisis. Of course, you know, when a crisis hits, it hits the most vulnerable the hardest, uh, which is definitely something that we're seeing um, among our residents where, you know, their income supports aren't going as far um, you know, we're seeing more people default on, you know, the very discounted rent that we do charge. So things are tight. Uh, but I don't want to leave it on this very dour note. Uh, I think Calgary actually has a lot going for it. Um, right now we're working with an administration uh in the municipal municipal government that uh is very concerned and very awake and aware uh to the issues that 
uh, vulnerable Calgarians are facing. Uh, I would also say that, you know, housing and cost of living is a major topic with this provincial election uh, that's happening right now. I think that it is on people's minds and uh, people are trying to find solutions. So yes, things are difficult. Things are, uh, and people are struggling. Um, but I don't think that we're talking about it in the same way that we used to here in Alberta. Uh, so there's something to be optimistic about when it comes to the potential for change going oh, forward. Fully agree with you. And I, I really appreciate that you said that because I, I feel that too. I think, again, what we're choosing to tolerate is starting to look different. Um, and there, and because of the influence, for example, of, of home space and feeding into policy discussions, which I think is kind of new for a lot of organizations to start feeding into policy, either by advocating or, you know, revealing data or telling those stories, which are, are very provocative. And sometimes a story can move a mountain faster than a pile of data, right? Um, we're starting to see things like the Affordable Housing Task Force recommendations that came out from, from city council today. Those were bold, I thought. And, um, you know, meaty. <laughs> it talk about rezoning. It talks about taking single detached housing out of the local area planning guide. It's just, it's, it's addressing nimbyism through policy. It's a very compelling set of recommendations that I don't think would exist if we didn't know these stories um, that home space tells. And so thank you for that. Thank you. Um, it is a scary line to toe, though, I'll tell you, when you are, you know, sometimes dependent on funding to try to get new buildings built to, you know, try to push, try to advocate, uh, but not be a jerk about it. So you alienate your uh, supporters, right? <laughs> I appreciate that, too. It is real. It's a very um, challenging policy environment, especially leading up to an election, especially in one. Um, to be able to access funding. I think that's a consideration for non sort of government funders like the Rotary to think about in terms of, you know, the, the really critical role <laughs> that a funder plays in, in making sure that organizations can have a voice and be honest and be able to, to advocate, I think is a really strong thing to consider. So the last question I'll ask you before we move into to broader questions, because Howie outlined a great flow today for me, which was awesome because I am from Newfoundland and tend to ramble occasionally. Um, this report was about really about measuring what matters, right? So a lot of the things that we're called on to measure report on are like number of people served or, and, you know, this is all important. It's not too, right? Um, a lot of output kind of stuff. Um, from your perspective, if we were to like measure what mattered to you and your organization, if there was a measurement for that, that went beyond people served um, or bricks and mortar, what might that look like? And Cora, I'm gonna start with you. What, if we measured one thing that really mattered to you that's not currently measured, what would that look like? Uh, yeah, thank, thank you, Megan. Yes, uh, I think if there is a, one thing to be measured uh, to me uh, or to the organization that I serve is uh, <clears throat> developing the capacity and the skill level, because here is our concern. The concern is now the job, the, the job skills are shifting and we are in, a, in an economy that is driven by, by where the jobs are going. For us to, I think, to, to, uh, to, to bring our society on this speed, uh, providing the skill needed for our economy to keep running or for our community to keep running mm -hmm. is to, to, to provide that level feel of, of a skill where people are able to be employable in whatever jobs are available. Because one of the, one of the reason, uh, uh, our data shows that 67% uh, were worried about their their jobs during the uh, during the uh, the COVID. Is that a lot of people are required to their job were to they are essential workers, so they have to be physically there, or either the 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 companies shut down completely and they are out of work, 
uh, or some of them were worried that, yeah, my, my job is going to be out of, of service anytime soon. So, so I think providing that new skill that our economy needs is what, what, what I, can, I, I can prioritize. The other, the other, the other thing is, uh, like I, like uh, Corey said, I think providing people with food is not a solution. But because how far and when are we, how can we just continue providing food instead of giving people the skill and they are able to work and they buy food for themselves and giving that uh, employability and also how can how can the market be affordable to people? For example, we are we are the richest province in Canada, hmm. and and if if ever everything is going up and we cannot keep up with that, then what are we going to do? That is the wariness of some of the community members that that uh, are serving. So providing that area and also helping kids to direct kids in where the jobs are leading mm. because we talked about in the problem even now we are talking about oh yeah we have shortage of workers so we are mumbling around while some of our uh, potential workers are either going to be homeless or or to to cannot afford whatever uh, affordability is so where are we going so i think those are the kind of areas we can look at i am going to take I, those are amazing areas that aren't often <laughs> measured and I take some moderator liberties with that and say you know what if we measured someone's ability to be able to predict what's going to happen in their own future like what if we measured that so that would look like I'm not worried about my job with the slightest emergency I'm not worried about where my food's going to come from a year from now because because we're, we're going to keep things affordable I I'm not worrying about my next step what if predictability in somebody's life was a measurement. I think that'd be very compelling. Um, Emily, over over to you. What would you measure if, if you were measuring what matters? Something you're not measured on now. It's a little bit hard to explain, but I would love to be able to measure, um, I guess the effectiveness of housing by measuring one's life chances. Yeah. Um, and that might be, uh, you know, measuring whether somebody was able to go back to school for the you know first time because they had access to affordable housing so they could improve their skills uh, and get a job that they uh that was a better job that they were better suited for and liked more uh or you know if we could measure uh, improvements in health if we could measure improvements in mental health or uh you know uh, acuity of addictions even being able to i guess yeah, the intersectionality of all of those things, uh, you know, where people um, that measure, you know, the quality of someone's life, I would love to be able to um, see the outcome of that. Um, I'd also love to see, you know, some really clear numbers projecting uh, where and how we need to build to accommodate all of these new Calgarians that we are anticipating. Mm -hmm. you know, I heard a number the other day that we're getting 69 new Calgarians every day. Mm -hmm. um, and if we could, uh, I guess, like visualize where and how we're going to accommodate all these newcomers so that they, uh, you know, have the chance to live, work and play, um, you know, with food security in their neighborhoods, uh, I think we could do a much better job of projecting and um, meeting those needs for a growing city. Oh, it's provocative. It's about quality of life. And what I what I sort of love about what you said there is that, um, you know, sometimes in the game of poverty reduction or working with people in poverty, it's like their poverty is less or they could they could afford rent and food. And it's like, when did we start normalizing that thinking? And instead of looking at it as, you know, what are your barriers to thriving, thriving in this community, not just surviving. And I, and I, if we're, until we're looking at those things, I think um, we're not, we're not measuring thriving. We're, we're, we're measuring like, you know, how, how close we got to the bottom. Right. And I think measuring thriving and all those intersection points would just be so compelling. 
Um, Corey, what do you wish was measured? Yeah, luckily I got to go last. I got to think about this a little bit, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I would say something you picked, you talked about a little bit in the report of that, the, uh, not necessarily the malnutrition, but like the healthcare impact of mm -hmm. Food insecurity, which is something proof is the 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 institute I, I mentioned has has talked about and has some research on, um, but I mean their essential pitch is between that and alignment of benefits, something like UBI would pay for itself, and I think there's something really to be said to if folks are making are sacrificing their nutrition, are skipping meals, like, like, obviously, these things are unhealthy, um, that like there is a cost on the healthcare system. Uh, the other thing I would say, I think that would be helpful to measure, because I wonder sometimes if this is it's it's all almost just too abstract. Is you know we used to talk about hunger, now we talk about food insecurity. I think food insecurity may it like don't get me wrong, that's the better thing to talk about. It's a more comprehensive thing. It's it's important because we're talking about appropriateness of food. But I don't wonder if sometimes we lose the. Um, the emotionality element in it. And when we talk about like, how do you measure food insecurity? Is it marginal? Is it moderate? Is it severe? And we, and we categorize it like that. When you look at the questions that they ask and like I, the shirk questions are like, I don't know, six, six questions or whatever um, that uh, look at this talks about skipping meals. So like, what if we reported that as well, this number of people said they skipped a meal or had to sacrifice their 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 children's nutrition rather than reporting the kind of academic stat on I'd like do that as well the the the, the data point but from a, a a communication standpoint that like what does this mean what does that look like and and you have that in the uh, uh, the, the the qualitative like the stories element but I think also talking about you know the volume of like this many kids had their nutrition um parents reported like kids nutrition is suffering or parents reported skipping a meal like some of those things that basically exist within the data but it's just um like how how you measure food insecurity is just like you, you mark these questions if you kind of reported some of that base statistic i wonder if, if it wouldn't have a little bit more resonance as well of, of communicating like what this even that even marginal food insecurity mm -hmm. i think sometimes people read the description it's like oh well that's maybe you know that sounds normal um but understanding that no that that actually means people are are making hard choices about what their families are eating I think there's there's a lot in there. And um, one of the things I really appreciate about what you said is like, we've sometimes created this ecosystem where it's like numbers, dispassionate sort of facts and figures. And sometimes we wrap a lot of um, language around things that I think uh, softens the blow of what this actually is. And what if we measured our community's ability to actually rise to urgency? I think sometimes wrapping around some of that language is a way to excuse ourselves from urgency. Like hunger is urgency. I think using food insecurity buys you a bit more time, if I'm being quite honest, right, from what we see. And so what if what if that was a measurement of how how do we recognize that something is urgent? It's an emergency. And, and what does it look like to address that? Because hungry children is in a wealthy country is an emergency. Right. And that I feel like we've drifted away from that sometimes in our measuring. Right. And we can't change what we don't measure. And I, I sort of think, you know, you all spoke so beautifully about, you know, none of that was like a participant outcome, you know, and all of that was about whether the people that we work with can access the same opportunities, regardless of how much income is coming in. And and have a thriving quality of life because we should have that here. And I guarantee everybody in this room that these are solvable problems and that we can do it. And the people in this room and this panel are the experts on how to absolutely get there. Um, Howie, I'm gonna look at you because we're gonna do, I think some questions from the audience. Should we move into that? I think Megan, let's, let's do that. And uh, maybe we can just, People can just uh, put up their hand or, or else sure. we might uh, be a little bit more direct. But uh, I, I think I, I would be kind of interested as you hear this, whether you're a Rotarian or I notice we've got some folks from community agencies here too, like Bobby and, and Bethany and uh, 
just and Deb, I mean, relative Mary, I mean, what are your, you know, just as you hear this, I mean, and you kind of, uh, I mean, because me, the, the wicked question that that you asked, Megan, of, of the panel, I'm saying, why aren't we doing it? Why aren't we measuring that? If that's what we'd like to measure, what the heck's getting in our way? And I include, I include Rory in that. So it's a wicked question because there's no obvious answer to it. But what is it in our system that prevents us from doing that up to this point? If that's what we really need to measure. Anyway, let's just throw it open. But Joe, up. I think I see Joe's hand up there. Great, Joe, super, thanks. Hey, first of all, I want to thank the panel. This was very, very enlightening. And I uh, you know, was amazed that uh, someone mentioned that 69 newcomers every day in the city of Calgary, uh, knowing what the market is like in Calgary, it's, it's, it's a horrible situation. But one of the things that we really need to do collectively is basically shout it out from some mountain that people that have got problems with food security, it's not because they're lazy. It's not because they don't know how to budget. It's because of our situation in the city of Calgary, you know, with high rent, high child care, and I'm not getting into the liberal thing, because I think this is a really good thing that's coming around, and the cost of utilities, groceries. I mean, people, they're stuck. If one of their children gets sick, they can't afford to buy antibiotics because it, it's not in the regular budget and they've got to move on. But I, we've got to express that to the general public that this is just not a case of laziness. These are people that really need our help. Absolutely, thank you. And, and I think that's a message to really carry to circles, right? Like again, the majority of people who live in poverty in, in this province are working for and uh, best budgeters I've ever met, right? Like I think that's a really old narrative about laziness and et cetera, right? And so everybody here has a sphere of influence that they can influence. I think it's such an important message, uh, Joe, to share. Mary, I see your hand up there. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm really uh, excited to be part of this discussion today and uh, just to listen to the rich conversation about this. And um, yeah, I think what we're talking about, we've been talking about this food security for quite a while now. It's been a topic that has been going. And uh, yes, I know there's a lot of work that has been done, but uh, to me, it looks like, uh, I don't know, it's like work has been done and yet the issue is not, is not solved. So I don't know what uh, need to be done. But uh, uh, there's one thing that J Joe mentioned that, that touch where I'm currently working. So I'm working with the pediatric community rehabilitation now. And uh, talking about families, when you talk about when families are struggling, there are so many families that are tr struggling to put food on the table. And then you have a child that has a disability and food is an issue for them you have to provide them with a certain type of food for them to be able to eat. And then you don't have the resources to provide such type of food because you go to the, to the store, the food, uh, the prices have skyrocketed. You can't afford that. And so it turns from food insecurity to actual hunger. So the child cannot feed. This is a sick child. This is a child with disability that has that is special need. He's not able to even get the to to afford the basics of life. It is scary. Me, me, I mean, talking to, I mean, listening to some of these parents when they begin to express their concerns, it, we wonder how can we get this issue resolved. Mm -hmm. So. I'm really happy we're still talking about it and I hope we get uh, a solution to it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mary. I, I think you highlight something and maybe I'll ask Bobby, who's also got her hand up to help respond to it. It's, it's the stickiness of that systems issue. Like if we really look at the core root causes of things, it explains why, like we keep throwing, you know, there's like a lot of food providers, for example, we keep throwing, you know, band-aids on, 
some, some pretty large and complex problems that are really held up the system, right? So, you know, what if we had a basic income? What if um, our government took a, any government, any order of government took a lens to, um, let's getting people above the poverty line even. Like really, you know, Asia is closest to the poverty line. It's still like 30% below the poverty line. That's mm -hmm. a strange way to put in a social problem. It was very um, systemic as well. I think it's such a great point. Bobby, um, over to you. Curious to get your thoughts. Oh, you're on mute, mute, mute. <laughs> yeah, I, got, I have so much to say. I didn't even unmute myself. Oh. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, um, oh, I've got a lot to say. I'll, I'll keep it quick though. One, the one thing I would like, there's three things I'd like to, to, to mention. One is, um, the, and this will be, we're, we're disruptors in the space. We know that doesn't make us very popular sometimes. So probably what I have to say won't be that shocking, but, um, the, when, in a lot of cases, I find that the sector works against itself, that we're not doing ourselves a whole lot of favors in, in, in many respects, that are, we have to sit back and look at, are we part of the problem or are we part of the solution? And how are we, how are we participating as part of the solution? And not what makes us feel good in that, not what suits a donor who needs to provide 30 volunteers for an opportunity. Um, you, you know, like, are we, I just want to, one of the things that, you know, and I can only speak to the food security space is that, and, and I heard it and, and respectfully accept that, you know, um, Corey's comments and yours as well, Megan, but we're not doing ourselves any favors by educating the general public society by focusing on a sexier word of hunger versus the reality of food insecurity. Um, you know, and, and we're really trying to plow through a message of helping people to think differently about people who are food insecure because we're all hungry at some point in our day even. Um, so, you know, it's just a one, and again, respectfully so, but it's just one example of, are, are we working towards the solution or are we holding ourselves back and, and catering to the problem more than advancing some of the solutions? Um, I feel that the solutions are in empowerment. How do we empower the people who we are serving to, to reach that point of thriving in their lives? So, um, you know, we're, our, our approach is based on research and evidence. Um, we are a very good example, I believe, that an income-based subsidy is proof, like, and we're doing that through a grocery gift card, which is an income-based subsidy, does so much more to lift a household in so many ways. Um, more than we can achieve with, with food alone. And we know that because we used to be solely focused on providing food. And now we've switched our focus to an income-based support. Um, and you know, when we can stabilize housing by providing financial assistance through grocery gift card, then what else is that achieving for that family? And Emily can speak a whole lot more to that than I can. Um, but you know, I just, Mary made a good, great point. And, you know, we've had some really great conversations with Mary about, look, how do we, how do we do better by the kids that, and these families that are struggling, you know, it's not families that are super well off that are knocking on Mary's door. But if we want to see these kids be, you know, thriving, then how are we part of their solution, which is the family solution. And um, anyway, it's just like, I could rant on forever about that, but I just want to make sure that this sector doesn't continue to work against itself towards better solutions for those that we're trying to serve. If we are, if we have the opportunity to set an example by moving how we do things in a different direction that we know at the end of the day is really 
is really genuinely serving our mission, then that's what we should be doing. But I just find the sector itself gets really caught up in trying to ple be everything to everybody or please certain groups. Like I have to please my donors. I have to please, and, and yeah, we do, but we can also educate them and start moving them towards more effective supports until we get to that place of the government is now going to make sure that everybody earns a living wage or, you know, is paid a basic income of whatever that is. But until I see the sector making more deliberate movements in their programming to, I just don't think things are going to change a whole lot. And I don't want to sound like the Debbie Downer in the group, but at the end of the day, we set the pace for change. The sector sets the pace for change. And if the sector and the people who are playing in this space are unwilling to make change within their own organizations, if what's going to change? What will move? No, thanks, Bobby. I think, and it, to me, the, the, I appreciate the discourse and the uh, the both ends of that. I guess um, the the, and I, I think what's really quite poignant that you said there is like until the the problem and solution rests in the right. Place, which is the government, right? So I think we have one of the challenges we have as a nonprofit sector is that we are just like filling holes and patching holes and doing all of those things. You know, again, solvable problem. Um, there is enough for all. There is enough income to to distribute differently. Um, you know, that looks at system savings in other places, right? Like a basic income would save us a lot of money in healthcare costs, for example, right? It's all sort of solvable. So. Um, it's, it's how we're coordinating as a sector and su supporting while we are also pointing at government and others to say, hold on, and business, you aren't paying a living wage to say, well, hold on a second. We can't be carrying this by ourselves because it's a hell of a lot. Corey, um, over to you. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on what Bobby was saying there, like wholeheartedly agree. Uh, I, I, I think a really, a way, so it's funny, I, I, before working with leftovers, I, I ran a small food bank. So I have a, a, a broader background in, in, in working in, in, I guess, food insecurity, but you know, our organization is thought of as a food insecurity organization. We, we touch it. I think we've been positioned our way ourselves that way more in the past, but like I, we're in the process, I think of really trying to move to like, we're an environmental organization. We're focused on the food waste because food rescue is not a good solution to food insecure. It's, it's not even not a good solution. It's not a solution. Uh, it's an input to emergency food programming, which has a really limited effect on, you know, assisting people day of um yeah 100 percent. like like bobby said i i i you know we know the solution it's income whether that be through um you know gift cards whether that be a direct direct transfer something like ubi a yeah it, it is a little I, I i get what you're saying bobby and it is a little frustrating i think sometimes in in the space because we know that even you know food bank usage like a food bank usage doesn't solve somebody's problem it can it can help make ends meet kind of maybe for a period of time um but it's not actually meeting the underlying need of that individual um and i think one of the things so talking maybe about like that that idea of like are we talking about hunger are we talking about food insecurity there's been a little bit more media on it but one of the things i would really say and i i think exactly like you're saying, Bobby, I think the sector has been guilty of perpetuating this, that the emergency food system as it exists meets people's needs. I think the underlying, there, there's this assumption in, in, in the underlying populace that if you're in trouble, the food bank's there to help you and that will be enough to support you. And that the folks who are using the food bank, that's the process they're going through. And it's a reality could not be further from the truth, but that that's a prevailing myth in society that, yeah, basically that the social safety net there is, it, that it exists and is there for you and it is sufficient, which is not true. Uh, and I don't know how to, I don't know how to, how to <laughs> fix that, but like it, it, it is a problem. I think that if I can just pop in there, Corey, I think that part of it is defining emergency 
because we certainly seem to cannot get ourselves out of an emergency. So how are we defining emergency? And then how are we defining transformational change, right? Like how are we transforming a household to go from completely unstable in the myriad of ways, like because of the housing, their housing situation or food security or mental health or whatever that is. It's transforming um, their ability to care for themselves, to provide their own basic needs. But we're stuck in the emergency. Like we're just stuck, stuck, stuck. Like it's an emergency, so we respond. Emergency, so we respond. But we got to get beyond. And I think that, again, we're probably guilty as a sector of how do we define emergency? Right now, everything is an emergency. Um, so it's getting out of that it's moving and empowering people to experience transformational change in their home. And uh, yeah, so just leave it at that. Thank you. I'll stop talking. <laughs> Thanks, Bobby. Um, I'm going to throw it over to you, Emily. Yes. I mean, Bobby, you have an excellent point. And there is, you know, a t- debate to be had about, uh, you know, wealthy voters donating to nonprofits so that, they can feel good about fixing a problem that we need systemic solutions to that really, you know, the government should be uh, addressing uh, for everyone as a society. Uh, That being said, I think that uh, supply when it comes to housing is definitely an issue, which is deeply impacted by the financialization of housing in Canada that has, you know, played into the crisis that we're experiencing right now. Uh, And we do need to be investing as a society in affordable housing because it's part of, uh, you know, creating a healthy society. So, um, but is the government doing that? And are they doing that at the levels that they need to be doing right now? Um, You know, so that's the gap that I think that nonprofits like Homespace are trying to fill at the same time advocating for policy change. Mm -hmm. Because there are some policies uh, that could deeply impact you know the housing sector right now when it comes to you know landlord discrimination when it comes to you know incentives to be building affordable housing whether that you know requires uh, zoning changes to ensure that affordable housing is planned into communities um and it also you know could affect uh you know these big investors that are buying up you know family homes across Canada that you know are driving up prices uh, but in the meantime, we do need to be building affordable housing. And if that means that, you know, that's what we do really well, and we need to fund, you know, these nonprofits that can develop uh, on time and on budget, then that's what we got to do uh, to try and fill that gap. But the conversation is changing. And I think that society is uh, getting to the point where we're ready to address the issue on a more uh, general scale, uh, you know, from the federal government perspective, and we'll see what happens, you know, provincially, but it's on people's minds. So, um, we just have to keep pushing. Oh, so, so great. And, um, housing is like in the top three kind of concerns of Albertans. If you look at the, the polling, housing affordability being the top two, and that's different. I mean, I, it seems obvious to maybe the people in this room, <laughs> but that is different. I love that you said that, Emily, as a conversation. And um, let's look at, you know, what's really going on here. Financialization of housing is a massive, massive policy area. And again, solvable problem. It's amazing the type of supply that we could free up if we actually addressed that. Um, I just want to point to the fact that in the chat, there's been a few great comments. If you haven't looked, um, Bill, Bill is uh, sort of asking about, um, you know, how Rotarians can figure out uh, ways to assist in, in sort of the, the job side of things that Cora was speaking to. Um, Gary's talking about, you know, food insecurity and hunger, food deficit. Maybe that's a language question again. Corey, absolutely about the food bank, like emergency for 43, 50 years, I think in, in Calgary is the length of our food bank. So that whole definition of insanity is trying the same thing over and over and expecting different results, right? Um, and then, Mark, I really appreciate your comment in terms of um, governments being late to the party. I think what's, uh, you know, the challenging part, at least what we're seeing in the sector is that I've been saying for two years, that the sector is really burned out. And I, I don't know how long we can keep 
carrying that as a sector in terms of just being the sole ones having to do this advocacy. There's a lot of really good books about uh, studying, you know, when governments stopped being partners in policy change and when the when the onus shifted to nonprofits to be the ones who are having to force policy change at governments. And I think that um, I think that's that was a tipping point that's creating other needs for other tipping points now. So really great point. Um, any sort of last thoughts before I kind of go back to the panel just to see if they have any last words and then I'll throw it over to you, um, Franco and Howie. So any last thoughts from the group? Oh, Bobby, <laughs> sorry, sorry. sorry. I said I'd stop talking, but I have to make a comment on Mark's, um, uh, you know, one of the things about the nonprofit sector is that we can do things that government cannot achieve or that they're slow to come to the table to address. And that's one of the things that I really appreciate most about being in the sector is that we can take risks where government can't, and then we can prove the models that work as in setting the good example of, okay, see, we did it here, you can do it too on a much larger scale. Awesome, thanks Bobby, that's very true. Um, so I'm going to go to CORE. Any last thoughts or words as we wrap up the, the panel today? Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Megan. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, talking about, uh, these are very good, uh, this is very good discussion. Yeah, talking about the gap of service, because uh, when, I, when I speak or from where I come from, from the organizational point of view is that a lot of time, the gap of service is really needed. And the people that have the lived experience in this situation are also needed in the conversation. How do we, and how can we actually, what, what Joe was talking about, how do we move from addressing a, a crisis or an emergency to being proactive on addressing the issues beforehand? And I think this is uh, very critical. So here I wanted to, to, to say, uh, practically having to, to eradicate poverty in our community or in our, uh, our city is that we need to create a culture of inclusion to allow social innovation. And I talked about employment earlier, social in, in, in innovation and, and embrace inclusive policies, policies that reflect the need of our society today developing mm -hmm. including uh, inclusive service uh, programs and equitable services that reflect the community needs and also committing to engage low income or slash newcomers population to that are that have the live experience of of the life that we are going to the hardship that we are going to because of, instead of always uh, addressing the crisis or the emergency, I think we can we can create opportunities in uh, opportunities in the state, uh, or, or opportunities in uh, community building, engagement, all sort of things. Because we don't want it to end up, you know. Address sometimes when people and as I talked earlier, when people get into the situation of becoming homeless because they lose their job, they lose their housing, they don't have food, they go to shelter. Now at the shelter, you are not addressing, now it become now a mental health issue, okay? Now you are, you are not talking about employment to this person. We are, you are, not, talk, we are not talking about, about you know, housing. Housing in, in a very emergency situation. So going back to the emergency situation or a job that, that is emergency situation because once mental health kick in and it's not addressed, this person will go back to work and in three months, boom, has no job, come back to the shelter. How do we deal with that? How do we, 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 we address mental, be, being proactive in addressing mental health instead of 
being there now, uh, we can we can we can uh, help this person. How do we address the market situation where we live in where we cannot some most of uh, most percentage from from the presentation that you did you alluded to cannot be addressed now because it's, some of them are too late to be addressed. What do we do? We become helpless. Helpless society, what are we going to do? I um, think we, knew, we need to move from there to, to being proactive in addressing the issues. Excellent call to action there on, you know, why are we in, <laughs> let's, not normal, let's not normalize where we are either. And why, why aren't we doing more to, to prevent it? Um, Corey, any last final quick thoughts from you? No, uh, well, maybe just I think I, I think going back to something I said earlier of like the um the, the the affordability crisis I guess is it like is it's being called but like that idea that yeah food banks have been around for forty years but uh their usage is no longer like they're in a new era that's what they're saying and 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 they have the kind of largest volume at least in the in the food security space. Um, and so to me, that makes me really nervous to the future because food inflation took a long time to even start to bend mm -hmm. and it hasn't come down, not like regular, uh, not like the, the rest of inflation. So I think we're in the current moment for a while here. Uh, and I think we, I think it's important to recognize it may be a new moment, um, I don't know what that means, but just just kind of recognizing we're in a little bit new territory here. Mm. I um I think that's really that is pretty profound. This is astute and profound. All those things. We are in a new moment, and um, we have this, especially now. I think post pandemic, strange recency bias around like we're just attached to the last thing that we heard, and um, we're not really thinking about the longevity of, of what's happening on some of these fronts. Emily, any final words from you to close this out? Uh, can I say I love where this conversation went. I think it got uh, much more interesting than I was anticipating. Um, it does feel like we're in a new era, uh, but I think that's something we can take away from this is to um, take advantage of it because uh, this kind of desperation can breed systemic change mm -hmm. and it affects public opinion. And I think that it's all of our responsibilities to be brave right now to call for that systemic change that uh, we want to see in our society to make a better society. So I want to thank you all for your contributions today, because um, though we're in a scary moment, um, I think that we can be hopeful. Hmm. What an amazing, what an amazing note to, uh, to sort of end on. I just, before I hand it over to Howie and Franco, want to say, a profound gratitude to the panelists and everything that you do. I mean, I think at VCC, we often recognize our privilege and the fact that we get to advocate and study and do all those things, but we're not actually like in there um, in the service side. And it's, that is the hard part. So, um, and asking questions also easy part. <laughs> so thank you so much for, um, for allowing me to be your moderator. Well, Howie and Franco. Thank you so much, Megan, uh, core, Emily and and uh, and, and uh, Corey, uh, very very robust conversation, and so I think uh, the question always is to me when you end up with this conversation, uh, this is not an action group itself to get something done. Uh, it is more about what each of us, what we put in our hearts and souls, and bring it to our own circles of influence. That's really where the action takes place, and so I think. The, certainly that's what I'm taking away and it was a reminder again uh, even though I was very I'm very familiar with enough for all but in fact that we do have a strategy in the city that it really is about well let's all get behind it in our own respective ways and figure out how we can advance that so I just again my our sincere thanks to the four of you but to all of us here this afternoon and hopefully it encourages us to uh, in each in our own circles to put some of this stuff to, to action, not the least in the middle of a cam political um, election campaign, lots of opportunities to raise some of these issues to make it a reality. So thank you. 